I'm Lauren Ball. I'm the author of uh, Where's the One About the Bobcat? It's an index and summaries of Patrick McManus' stories. And if you own all of his books and you can't remember where your favorite story is, this will help you find it. Uh, today we're going to read Secret Places, and it is found in the book uh, Real Ponies Don't Go Oink. So, <clears throat> here we go. Secret places. All my life, I've had secret places. I like secret places. They make me feel smug and superior. Two of the really great feelings. I've got the secret place, you tell a friend. Right away, he wants to know where it is. I can't tell you, you say, smugly superiorly, is a secret. I also hate secret places, other people's. Ross Russell has a secret hunting place I've been trying to pry out of him for years. Come on, Ross, you can tell me. I say, I won't ever sneak up there to hunt without you. We've, we've been friends for 40 years. What are friends for if not to tell their secret hunting places? Just tell me, okay? Can't. It's a secret. Tell me your secret hunting place if you want to live. I have about three dozen secret places scattered around the country. Some are nothing more than small gravelly beaches. Others are entire mountain valleys and even mountain ranges. Often I come across other people in my secret places. They, of course, have just as much right to be there as I do. It's very irritating. I suppose it's all right to share your secret places with strangers as long as you don't have to share the secret. When I was a boy, I loved secret places even more than I do now. Within a three mile radius of our farm, I had staked out hundreds of secret places, fishing holes, hunting spots, caves, swamps, lookout trees, old cabins, and even several culverts under the highway. Some of my secret spots were shared with particular friends. This will be our secret spot, I would say to my friend. Nobody else will know about it. Okay, he would say. Then we would take a spit oath. If I had taken a blood oath for every one of my secret spots I shared with someone, I would have been a quart low most of the time. Besides, spit oaths are much less painful than blood oaths. Occasionally I would fall off a cow or pig or something and end up with a bloody nose. That was the only time I cared about taking a blood oath. Let's say this is our secret spot and take a blood oath on it, I'd tell crazy Eddie Muldoon as I tried to dam the flow of blood from a nostril. In the middle of a cow pasture, he'd say, this ain't a good secret place. It's good enough, I'd reply. I want to take a blood oath on it, so cut your finger. I don't want to cut my finger, not for a blood oath on a secret place in the middle of a lousy cow pasture. Why don't we both just use your blood? Okay. Eddie had the right instincts. Secret spots seldom had any special use other than to be secret. Fishing holes made good secret spots and were useful, but mostly what we did in secret spots was to sit around in them feeling smug and superior. It was quite evident to us that half the population of the world was simply dying to know the location of our secret spot. And that was sufficient for us. Crazy Eddie and I did find one secret spot that we put to excellent use. One day we crawled up to the naked joists in the Muldoon garage. There were a few boards scattered around on the joists to walk on, so we walked on them, holding our arms out like tightrope walkers to maintain our balance and keep from smashing our skulls on the concrete floor below. We came to a sheet of plywood laid over the joists, like an island in the air, and stopped there to rest. There were some boxes stacked on the sheet of plywood, and we sat down on them. Hey, you know what? Eddie, I said, this would make a great secret place for us. Yeah, he said, good idea. We can come up here and... Well, 
and we can come up here. Sure, I said, this would be perfect for that. Hey, what's in the boxes? Eddie lifted a lid. Just some empty canning jars. Maybe we can think of something to do with them. Eddie smiled. I got an idea. We could fill them. Fill them with what? Eddie explained what we could fill them with. <laughs> hey, that's good, I said. It will be kind of like scientific research. We can see how long it takes us to fill all these jars. Eddie and I started our research immediately and managed to fill one of the jars about one-third full, which wasn't bad considering we were acting on short notice. We screwed the lid back on the jar and set it neatly back in its box. Scientific research was fun. The project was started in late spring. We worked on it well into the hot days of summer. Our dedication was enormous. A group of us kids would be fishing off the Sand Creek Bridge, and Eddie would say, uh Oh, I've got to go to the bathroom. Then he would leap on his bicycle and ride madly off toward the secret place in his garage where I knew he would climb the ladder, balance his way across the boards on the ceiling joists to the sheet of plywood, and make a contribution to the scientific project. The other kids would stare after Eddie as he pedaled frantically off up Sand Creek Hill. How come Eddie rides his bike all the way home to go to the bathroom? Someone would ask me. This not being the standard practice of the group. I can't tell you, I'd say. Eddie and I are conducting a secret scientific experiment in our secret place. Come on, tell us! Nope, can't. It's a secret. I'd feel smug and superior all over. One sizzling hot July day, I asked Eddie what the count was now. Thirty-nine fall and a good start on the fortieth, but we're almost out of jars. Maybe you could ask your mom for some more empty jars, I suggested. Maybe. We headed for Eddie's house to ask his mom for some more empty jars. As we were passing the open door of the Muldoon garage, we noticed Mr. Muldoon's legs disappearing up a ladder in the direction of our secret place. Pretty soon we could hear him tramping across the narrow board walkway on the ceiling joists. What are you doing up there, Pa? Eddie called out nervously. Obviously Mr. Muldoon had no idea he was violating a secret place. Oh, I stored a couple of planks up here. Stay where you are. I may need some help getting them down. He stepped onto the plywood sheet that formed the floor to our secret place. Now what's this? Oh, well, I'll be dang. Your ma's got some kind of canned goods stored up here. Why would she put it up here instead of in the cellar? Looks like some kind of juice. I don't know what's got into that woman. This stuff's probably spoiled simmering up here in this heat. I better open a jar and see what it is. Eddie and I looked at each other. He could tell I was winding up my mainspring that would shoot me off home. Pa, he said, I, I don't think you should... We heard the tinny plink of a lid popping off a canning jar, followed by a strangled, choking shout from Mr. Muldoon. We could hear him staggering about, then crashing into the crate of jars. The jars tumbled down onto the concrete floor in a series of magnificent golden explosions. Powerful, toxic fumes filled the garage, bringing tears to our eyes. Ah! <coughs> Cried Mr. Muldoon, who apparently thought he, too, was being destroyed. We watched in horror as he leaped about in a series of pirouettes on the naked joists above, until at last he dropped into a space between them, luckily catching himself by the armpits. He then hung by his hands and dropped to the floor, apparently spraining both ankles, or so I judged from the manner in which he came hobbling out of the clouds of fumes, choking and gasping. Pa, pa, shouted Eddie, you destroyed our experiment, a whole summer's work. A rare moment of insight into the peculiar workings of Mr. Muldoon's mind told me that the destruction of our summer's work was the least of our concerns. Got to go home. I said to Eddie, oh, okay, he said, see you later. As I released my mainspring and shot by Mr. Muldoon, who was hunched over, choking and coughing and wiping his 
streaming nose and eyes, I very much doubted whether Eddie had a later. One of the best things you can do with the secret place is share it with a special friend. Sometimes, though, you don't even like the person you choose to share a secret place with. It is one of those strange psychological aberrations beyond human comprehension. My father died when I was six. Five years later, my mother remarried. I did not much care for my new stepfather at first. The only good thing about Hank was that he liked to fish, even though he wasn't very good at it. From time to time, he would take me fishing and try to make amends for rudely invading my domain, but I wasn't having any of it. We almost never caught any fish anyway. Hank was so poor at fishing, he was ecstatic when he caught so much as a little seven-inch trout, and he would even tell the neighbors about the fish he had caught. It was embarrassing. I hated to go places with him. It was so embarrassing to hear him tell his fish stories. He didn't even know how to lie properly. He would go into all the details about how he had baited his hook and dropped it into the current just so and let it drift down behind a sunken stump and then describe the thrilling strike of the fish. Gosh, how big was that fish, Hank? The neighbor would ask. Lie, Hank. I pled silently. Lie. Oh, good seven inches, Hank would say truthfully. Mm. The neighbor would politely respond. Stream fishing opened the first week of June. Huge cutthroat trout continued their spawning run up Sand Creek for exactly a week after the opening. One day the cutthroats would be there, and the next they would be gone. Hank knew nothing about the run of big trout. When opening day arrived, he was prepared to go out after another seven-incher. It was bad enough that I had to put up with a new stepfather. I simply couldn't stand the further embarrassment of listening to him tell his small fish stories, particularly to fishermen who would have spent the day hauling out huge cutthroat. Before first light on opening day, Hank and I headed down to Sand Creek. Practically the entire town had emptied out and now lined the banks of the creek to have a go at the cutthroat. Hank, of course, thought everybody was after his seven-incher. Cripes, he said. I think I'll go back home. We'd have to stand in line to get a chance to cast into the creek. Because Hank had never seen anybody else fish Sand Creek, he probably had come to think of it as his own secret place. He seemed depressed. Here he had his heart set on catching his seven-incher on opening day, and now it was ruined for him. Good idea, Hank, I said. You better go home. He turned and started to walk back to the house. At that moment, I was overcome by one of those weaknesses of character I despise so much in myself. Wait, I said. Wait, Hank. I'll take you to my secret place. Secret place? He said. What secret place? There was a large bend in Sand Creek that no one ever fished because the brush was so high and thick that it was assumed to be impassable. It was further assumed that if a person managed to fight his way through the brush, there would be no place to stand to fish the creek. But a couple of days before opening, I had found that I could crawl through the brush on my hands and knees. And on the other side of the brush, I discovered a tiny gravel beach right upstream from a magnificent fishing hole. It was one of the finest secret places I've ever come across. Half an hour later, Hank and I were crawling through the brush on our hands and knees. I let Hank go first to break trail. With typical clumsiness, he let a branch snap back and hit me in the nose. I could feel the trickle of blood begin to flow. The man was hopeless. His first five casts, Hank caught five cutthroat, all upward of two pounds, one approaching five. He was practically shedding his skin from him, the pure joy of it. I can't believe it, he cried. This is wonderful. I never realized fish this big even existed. His eyes were disgustingly moist. Still dabbing at my bloody nose, I had not yet got a line in the water. Hank hadn't even waited for me to get ready 
He was such a fish hog. You know what, Pat? He shouted at me. From now on, this will be our secret place. Just yours and mine. Oh, yeah? I said. In that case, cut your finger. How come? Because we have to take a blood oath on the secret place. Don't you know that? Hank stared at me as his shaking hands unhooked a 20-inch cutthroat. Maybe we could both just use your blood, he said. How does that sound? It sounded all right to me. I figured Hank might not turn out too badly after all. With the proper amount of training, he seemed to have the right instincts. And that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, like and subscribe, and um, I'll let you know when I post new videos. Thanks for watching.